Thank you, men. Thank you, folks, for being here this morning and worshiping the Lord. Thank you for turning on the television and worshiping with us. I'd ask that you take out your Bibles to the book of Colossians, to the first chapter, and our text this morning will be verses 24 through verse 29. That's the book of Colossians. Colossians is right after Philippians and just before 1 Thessalonians. Need to take a look just to make sure. <laughs> book of Colossians, the first chapter, beginning at verse 24. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's affliction, for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and for generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This mystery that uh, Paul is talking about is that throughout the Old Testament, the Jews, the 12 tribes of Israel, thought that they were not only the chosen ones, but the ones that basically were the only ones who were going to be saved. And then when we come into the New Testament, we find that this mystery, uh, this veil has been removed, it's been disclosed to Paul and to others, that it's going to be the whole world, that it's going to... Now this emphasis has been right from the point of Abraham, but it really was the uh, emphasis of the Old Testament that it was more the Jew, the Judaic way of, of following uh, life or religion. And so Paul is saying this, this mystery has uh, now been uh, made known, which is there, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Then in verse 28, we proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone everywhere with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. So just for a moment before we turn to our sermon, notice there that, that Paul, after he talks about this mystery has now been revealed, says, we simply proclaim Christ. This is our testimony. We live with the Lord Jesus Christ. We know him and love him and live for him. And in a sense, our lives is a proclamation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we teach everyone with all wisdom that the Lord Jesus is the basis of our lives. But notice how he, he does this. To this end, I labor. If you think the Christian life is going to be a life of, of just floating on a cloud or it's just going to be a life of ease here on earth, it's not going to be that way. It's always uphill. We are a minority. The flesh, the lust, the world, and other systems are against us. And Paul says, be realistic about it. He says, when it comes to Christianity, I labor. It is a bunch of work. He's saying it's, just, it's, it's taxing. It's stressful. It's difficult living the Christian life. Now, that's not much of an endorsement, is it? But listen, then he goes on to say, to this end, I labor struggling. Not only does, is he laboring, but he says, my goodness, it's a huge struggle for me to be a Christian. But he does it with all his energy, all of the energy of the Holy Spirit, which so powerfully works in me. And so this morning, we want to continue on studying about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, the outline that you have in your, your bulletin, I have some good news for you. As I've been studying the past number of weeks, I've noticed that, uh, that uh, this outline that we've put together, we're going to use it for three weeks. So don't, as I, if I get stuck on the introduction or just the first point, that's all we're covering for this morning. Don't feel that when it gets around 12 o'clock, you're saying, oh my goodness, he still has an awful lot of ground to cover. The good news is that outline is for two or three weeks, all right? So take encouragement in reference to that. So what uh, this morning, 
I want to hit the bullseye, and we're going to try to mainly hit one subject, and that subject will be, what is the work or the responsibility of the Christian when it comes to the Holy Spirit? All right, do we understand the bullseye? The bullseye is going to be, what is your responsibility? What is my responsibility when it comes to the person and the work of the Holy Spirit? Let's just pray and then we'll continue on. Father, we would ask that we'd hit the bullseye by your grace. We pray that we would have a deeper, fuller, richer, more meaningful understanding of our responsibility, of the work that we are to be when we have a life that is in alignment with the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we ask that your Spirit would be our teacher. Pray that for each and every one of us, that by your Spirit we would concentrate that we would really work hard to understand what is being said. And by your Spirit, it would stick to us. It would be real to us. There would be a sense of ownership so that when we leave here, there would just be a deeper appreciation that within us is the Lord Jesus Christ, is the power of the Holy Spirit. And we are to be in alignment with him so that we might live the kind of lives that would be Christ-like and effective for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was a 19th century English Baptist preacher that was really world famous. And he has made the statement, I have a great need to come to Christ, but I have a great Christ for my need. And that is a wonderful, wonderful thought. That we have great needs in our lives, and those needs are that we are to come to Christ. But the fact is that when it comes to meeting those needs, we have a great Christ. Now, if we were going to to ask Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who sort of was a world theologian during his uh, day and age, uh, how does God help us or meet our needs? If we all have them, and God does that, it just seems to me practical that we need to learn to know how does God meet our needs? physical and spiritual and emotional needs. And if Spurgeon was here, he would say, that needs or your needs are met through the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit, who is he? We've been pointing out that he very simply is God. But I want to give you other definitions. I want you to, if you do take notes, just take these words down so that you can have more of a fullness when it comes to understanding or understanding the expressions of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God as our helper. Now that's an interesting statement. See, when it comes to the spiritual life, It is not our responsibility to lead a spiritual life. It is not to try to do things. And and, and because what happens is if we do A, B, C, and D, E and F or whatever, well, we look back and we step back and say, hey, you know what? I'm getting to be a pretty good Christian here. I'm, I'm growing. The opposite thing happens is that when we have a bad week and we don't do A, B, or C, Oh, we just do A, we step back and say, oh, you know what, I'm not doing so great. I'm I'm really, this is a terrible, terrible week. And the emphasis ends up being on us. What we need to understand is that our responsibility, once we are saved, we become an instrument of the Holy Spirit. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God in his fullness, he moves inside of us as a spirit. And that spirit's responsibility is that he is the one that helps us live the Christian life. And in fact, we cannot live the Christian life on a consistent, effective, victorious, abundant way apart from alignment and connection with the Holy Spirit. So God, who knows this, has designed Christianity this way, says, I'll give you a helper. That helper will help you in living the Christian life. And so the Holy Spirit is God personally relating to us. 